Welcome back to the second week of Go Eat Popcorn. Silly name, but serious topic. It's, it's going through the four epistles that Paul wrote, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. And last week, we looked at Galatians, one of my favorite books in the Bible. I know I say that a lot, and it seems like I say it about every book, but it's true. Galatians has a special place in my heart because it was the place where the first time I really, I really knew that God was speaking to me through the Bible. And that's my prayer, that you are able to hear the voice of God whisper to you and that this book becomes alive and it jumps off the pages. And the number of people that the book of Ephesians is the place where God spoke to them is truly astounding. I know my mom loves this book. God has spoken to her over and over. And so today we are gonna look at the book of Ephesians. And it was written by the Apostle Paul, by St. Paul, while he was in prison. And he's writing this to the church that he helped found in Ephesus. So he's writing to them um, from a place of not fun, being in a prison, in a Roman prison. And he starts this book with two words, this is just an FYI, that is in every book in the Bible that he wrote. So every letter that he wrote, it says this, may God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you, and then these two things, grace and peace. And I just pray that today, that even as we go through Ephesians, that you're able to receive the grace, the goodness of God that you didn't even deserve, like the grace of God and his peace. In fact, we're gonna start by praying that right now. So Father, I just pray that that this time together is marked by your grace and your peace and that you speak to us. Thank you that because of you, Jesus, we're worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. So here's the, the big themes, and we're looking at, at four major themes from the book of Ephesians. And here's the first one, you ready? Because it's seen very quickly in the first chapter. And I want us to get this because Ephesians is so foundational for us as believers. What does it mean to follow God? What does it mean to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus? And here's what's so cool. It's a theme that we see all through the Bible. I can't help but remember um, the book of Exodus that we, that we finished up with two weeks ago. And the first theme out of that book is the same theme really that we see in Ephesians. And here it is, God chooses you. That's the first thing I want you to get, God chooses you. And this is what Paul writes. He says in, in verse three, all praise to God the Father our Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. You're blessed. You have to know that. You are blessed. Paul says, if you've given your life to Jesus, you are blessed with every spiritual blessing. The lie of the enemy is to make you think that you are without, but you're not. He says, because we are united with Christ. And here it is, verse four. It says this, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Before the world began, God chose you and he chose you to be his and he chose you to be a person that when he looks on you, what does it say? You're holy and without fault in his eyes. So here's my question. Do you see yourself that way? That you are chosen by God, that you are set apart for his work, that's holiness, and that he sees you without fault. Boy, the tactic of the enemy is to get us to believe that God sees us through every sinful, terrible, horrible thing we've ever done or even thought. But when we surrendered our life to Christ, he doesn't see us that way. He sees us through the lens of forgiveness and that Jesus's blood paid that price of sin on the cross. And so he can say with, with sincerity, I choose you. Your, your life is set apart. Now we have to live that set apartness, that's holy. That's running from sin. That's trusting God and believing that he has a purpose for us and that he sees us without, without fault. But where does that begin? It begins with this. He chose you. God chose me. I am chosen by God. This is the first theme that we see. And, and, and if we jump down, now listen, I'm painting with a broad brush. And if you've been serving the Lord for a long time and you're into in-depth Bible study and you're, you're picking apart individual verses, listen, that's all great stuff. 
But I'm preaching through all of Ephesians today, so big topics. The first one, we've been chosen by God, and he chooses us for a purpose and a plan. In fact, look at verse 10. This is the plan, that at the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ. Everything on heaven and on earth. Okay, so here it is. We got to know this. God has a plan. He chose us, but he has a plan for us. And here it is. Here's the plan. At the right time, he'll bring everything together under the authority of Christ. Let me just tell you, that brings so much peace to me when I'm walking through the middle of adversity and junk and through hurricanes and COVID and, and political insanity and social nutsoness that was the last year. Think about it, it's been one year. How much has happened? A lot, but I know this. God's plan is that at the right time, he brings everything together under the authority of Christ. Here's why people get frustrated. Here's why believers get frustrated and go, God, I thought that the Bible said all things work together for good. It does say that, but you got to keep reading. All things work together for good to those who love God and are called to his purpose. So we have to love God and we have to be called to his purpose. That's Romans 8, 28. The plan is that at the right time, he'll bring everything together. God turns everything around. He redeems everything in our lives at the right time. But here's the key. Under the authority of Christ. And and, and here's what I want you to get. Just as God said, I choose you. He's waiting for you to say, I choose you and your way. God, you're way bigger than me. I didn't make the earth. I, I I didn't put all this together. But you did. And so I'm going to trust you and I'm going to, boy, we don't like this term in today's society, under the authority of Jesus. Are you living your life under the authority of Jesus? If you are, you can know that this this truth, you know this, if that's the case, you know that he chose you, but you have decided to choose him. And you also know because you are under that authority and you're saying, Lord, not my will, but yours you know that at the right time, all things are going to be turned around. That's a good thing. My word, I'm going to have to hurry this up because we're still in chapter one, that God chose us and that we have to be willing to choose him. He chose us in advance and he makes everything work out according to his plan when we follow his way. And then Paul says about the Ephesians, he says, "Um, I've not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly. Pray that I can give you some wisdom. I pray that you understand, this is verse 19, the greatness of God's power. And then in chapter 2, he starts to to talk about something that's really huge. It's the past. And it's sin. And he says this in verse 1. He says, Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil. And then in verse four, he says, but God is so rich in mercy. He loved us so much that even though we were dead in the middle of our sin, he gave us life when he raised Jesus from the dead. And then in verse eight, it says this, such a key verse, because he chose us And the way that he chose us was to sacrifice. Because that's what love is, is sacrifice. And he gave more than himself. He gave his son. You know, you might lay down your, your life for somebody. But would you lay down your child's life for someone? That's how great God's love in choosing you. That's how big it is. And then Paul's writing and he says, you were dead because of those sins. You were choosing your way. You weren't under the authority of Christ. You were under your own. And yet even then, Jesus died for you. And then in verse 8, he says this, God saved you by his grace. Remember that first word we talked about? Grace. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. It's being made worthy when you know you and I know me. For by grace you've been saved when you believe. Do you believe? Do you believe that God chose you? Do you believe that Jesus really is Lord and King? We've been saved. This is what it says. God saved you by his grace when you believed. Can't take credit for this. 
It's a gift from God. You're made right with God because he chose you and he's waiting for you to choose him and surrender to him and recognize you're small and he's big, but he knows you and he loves you and he has a purpose and a plan for you. And when you say, Jesus, I am yours and you truly surrender in your heart, it is God's grace that brings you to the place of salvation, saved from sin, from the curse of sin, from eternal separation from God because he never designed hell for you. By grace, you've been saved through faith. And then it says this, the next sentence, in verse, the next verse, salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. In other words, you can't work your way into God's good grace. Grace by its very word means you don't deserve it. You can't work yourself like I'm worthy enough to, to do, I've got to do good things so that God will be pleased with me. Listen to me. God's pleased with you when you come to the place where you recognize he is and that he chose you and you choose him because it's a relationship. Salvation isn't a reward for the good things we've done. None of us can boast about it. Look at verse 10, so huge, for we are God's masterpiece. He's created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Do you see God's plan in all of this? Do you see God's plan? He, ch he chose you before the foundation of the earth. He's got a purpose and a plan for you. And that is Really, the first point, God chose you and he has a plan for you. Here's the second point, you ready? It's all about life together. So here's, the first one is God chose you. The second one is that God calls us to live together. Let's look at chapter three now. By the way, I'm skipping over some really great stuff, but for time's sake, I just don't have, I don't, I don't have time to do it all. So here's the other big thing is that God calls us to live together. Look at chapter three, verse six. It says, and this is God's plan. Do you see the plan weaved all the way through? Now we're in chapter three. There's only six chapters, so we're almost halfway through the book. And we see from the very beginning, God's plan that he's choosing you. But now here's part of his plan. Here it is, you ready? This is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children both are part of the same body and both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Christ Jesus. God is calling us to live together. I wish I could explain the context in which this was written because at the time, Jews thought that Gentiles were scum were worse than dogs. The Jews were so proud in their, in their faith. Really what they were proud in were their rituals, their religion, and they thought themselves better than everybody else. And yet here we have a Pharisee who's the top of the religious order, Paul, have an encounter with Jesus. And now he has this huge revelation that God has spoken to him, that his call is to the Gentile, the non-Jew. What would be the equivalent? It would be the equivalent, hmm, I'm, 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 I'm off the cuff in this, but it's so, it may be crazy. It would be the equivalent of a neo-Nazi, Aryanist racist, and the most hyperactive Black Panther, other end of the spectrum, both coming to know Jesus and then coming to walk hand in hand and say, we are part of the same family. This is what Paul's writing. And you know what he's saying? We, as the body of Christ, followers of Jesus, are called to walk together. That's what we're called to do. We're called to live life together. I'm gonna read it again. The Gentile, the Jew, the part of the same body, and both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Christ Jesus. I understand why there's division in the world because people are proud and want things their way. I struggle understanding division in the body of Christ because we're called to Jesus and to be like him. And we are part of the same body. We're called to live together. God's purpose, look at this verse 10, God's purpose in all of this is to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety 
to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. What is God saying? He's saying to the devil, devil, I know what your plan is for death, destruction, and division in this world, but look at my family. Look at these people who know me, whether they're white, whether they're black, whether they're Hispanic, whether they're Asian, whether they're rich, whether they're poor, whether they live in, in South Africa, or they live in Finland, or they live in Bolivia, or they live in the United States, or Canada, or Mexico, or, or China, or Taiwan. It doesn't matter. This is what he's saying. He says, God's purpose was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So that the devil goes, huh, look at that. Because God is saying, hey devil, do you see my people love me so much that I've transformed them. They've allowed me to transform them in what they were created to be, which is together. And there is no lie, no spirit of division that you can plant, whether whatever that is, because they are all part of the same body. We are called to live together. There's a spirit of division that's been in operation in the church to get people to fight. I know whole churches that have split because of, of a remodel or, or because somebody didn't like the music and they get, it's ridiculous, it's silly. We're called to love God with all of our heart and love each other. And when we do that, even the devil takes notice because our love for God trumps everything and our love and commitment to each other as part of the same body is seen by all, specifically the enemy who wants to sow seeds of division. This is such good stuff. And look, I, I got to hit verse 12. Because of Christ, our faith in him, we now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. Isn't that good stuff? I got to speed this up. Okay, I, I'm just going to go. Um, oh, that's so good though. Verse 17, Christ will make his home in your hearts. Your roots will grow down and keep you strong. <sighs> There's so much I could say, but I, I, I've got to be cognizant of time. Look at what Paul says in chapter four. He says, therefore, what's the therefore? That you embrace God's plan, that you know he chose you, that you choose him, that you surrender your, your life to Christ, you come under his authority, that you know that part of his plan is for us to do life together so that even the enemy takes notice and he sees our love for God and our love for each other. Therefore, that's why it's there, so that we can see that I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, Always be humble and gentle. This is like relationship 101 in the body of Christ and relationships in gem general. If we're gonna live together, be humble, gentle, be patient with each other. Look at this next one. Making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. The greater the love, the greater the allowance of, of, of wrongs. And, and that's why First, First Corinthians 13, the love chapter, Paul says that love keeps no record of wrongs. Make every effort to keep yourself united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body, one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. Can I tell you, even as I'm reading this, here's what grieves me. As I've watched some of these very words be politicized. And that people are saying that the church is being political when they're talking about unity between white and black, between Hispanic, between Asian, between socioeconomic groups. No, no, no. We're, we defeat the enemy by our love for one another and that we don't point out our faults and our flaws, but we make the main thing, the main thing, our love for God, our, our surrender and submission to Christ and our love for each other. May we never lose that. What is Paul writing? He's writing, God chose you, please choose him. Surrender to the submission of Christ, like submit to him and then love each other. These are the major themes. Whew. God calls us to live together and talks about the giftings. Then, oh, it's so good. I, I don't have time, I've gotta go on. Oh, but he says, then we'll no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown around by every wind of new teaching. We won't be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Look at this one. Instead, we speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ. Love, love doesn't dismiss sin, but it deals with it both specifically, sincerely, but also gently. 
You can be gentle and loving and rebuking someone. If that's never happened to you, I feel sorry for you because it's an awesome thing to be under the conviction of the Holy Spirit that's brought by another believing, pointing out a fault in your life. Many people, unfortunately, have been told things in the name of Jesus that maybe wasn't done in the right spirit. We're called to speak the truth, but to do it from a place of love. Why? So that they can grow in every way more and more like Christ. And we skip down, and the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Remember, love isn't a feeling, it's a sacrifice to always do the right thing by the other person, like for the other person. Okay. God calls us to live together. Here's the third thing. God calls us to live a life of love, and I'm kind of hitting on that right now. Look at chapter five, verse one. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you're his children. We're called to be like him. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us, and he offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. This is the foundation stone of love, doing what is best for the other person, even if it costs you everything. That's so hard. That is so difficult. Here's why, because we want to be right. But God's calling us, God's calling us to be sacrificial for the benefit of the other person. Yes, we speak the truth, but we do it from the place where we want them. What did it say that we're called to grow, become more and more like Christ? healthy, growing, full of love. Imitate God. Lay down your life for another person. Then he goes on to, if that's the case, the next verse, let there be no, and then it goes through all of these sins, sexual immorality, impurity, greed, such sins have no place. And then in verse 15, he says, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools. Don't live, uh, don't act thoughtlessly. And then in verse 18, he says, be filled. He says, don't be drunk with wine because that'll ruin your life. We all know that's true. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Chapter, uh, verse 21 of chapter five. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. We are called to love each other, to submit to one another. And then it goes wives. And that, that gets hot real quick. Then, but then it goes, husbands, lay down your life for your wife. Then in chapter 6, it talks about children, obey your parents. It talks about, in chapter 6, verse 4, fathers, don't provoke. Slaves, obey your earthly masters. Masters, treat your slaves in the same way. And, and how, can it, how can we talk about slavery? How can we talk about wives submitting and slaves? Here's how. Because in any relationship, when both parties choose to lay down their life for the other, there is no struggle for authority and power. There's only surrender submission, and sacrifice. That's how. I'm not going to go into the crazy ramifications that some people don't want to pull out, but here's the reality. Am I choosing to live life? Am I choosing God? Am I choosing to live life together? Am I choosing love? And here's the last thing he says in chapter 6. Here it is. A final word, and here it is. Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. We're called to know that we're chosen by God. We are called to live together. We are called to live from the place of love. And we're called to be strong and stand firm. And if you read the rest of it, it tells us how we're to do that. Here's my prayer for you. You know God chose you and you choose him. That you lay down your life for the people around you because you choose to love sacrificially. You submit yourself to other people rather than try to lord over them in being right. And you stand strong and firm in Jesus. That's Ephesians in a nutshell in 24 minutes. Too long, but that's all right. I want us to get, God's chosen you. He's called you to people. Called you first to him, then to people. He's called you to live with those people, to love the people around you, and to be strong. So I'm going to pray that that's the case. And and maybe God's knocking on the door of your heart and he's saying to you, choosing, open it to him.
Father, I just pray right now that if there's someone here that hears my voice and they sense that you are knocking on the door of their heart saying, I'm choosing you, let me in, let me in. Let me in. That Father, that right now they choose you and recognize your love for them. They open up their own heart. They pour out all the junk and the sin before you. You make them clean. As they love you, they choose to love people around them and stand strong in Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if somebody is listening to my voice and you, you prayed that prayer and you meant it, let us know. I wanna connect you with some people that can encourage you and help you grow. Love you, God bless, bye-bye.